Good morning, church. It is such a joy to welcome you to this time of worship together. I'm Tanya Arneson, senior pastor of this great congregation, First United Methodist Church here in Jackson, Michigan. I want to welcome all of you who are here in person this morning. I want to welcome all of you who are watching via our live stream or who will view us on cable later this week. It is good to be together no matter how we choose to be together. If you are watching us online, I encourage you to download and print out a copy of the bulletin. Those who are here in the sanctuary have received this, but this has a printout of all of the prayers, all of the hymns that we'll be singing, so that you can follow along and feel more fully engaged in this worship experience together. I want to just acknowledge uh, two or three announcements before we move into our worship time. First of all, the beautiful flowers here are um, in honor of Linda Knoll. We celebrated her resurrection here in the sanctuary yesterday morning. And um, the family has asked to leave them here in order to beautify our space. And the flowers here are given um, by Jerry Verhoeven in honor of her daughter, Robin. There will be 15 minutes after the end of the postlude, there will be a town hall meeting here in the building down in the fellowship hall we do ask you to com continue to be masked as we gather downstairs and just pay attention to reasonable social distancing. I know many of us have been fully vaccinated, and so we're feeling a little bit more confident when we gather, but we do ask for those uh, who have not yet been vaccinated that we protect one another. Um, the town hall meeting will begin about 15 minutes after the end of the postlude, and we will conclude an hour after we start the town hall meeting. It will be led by Candy Pileski and Jan Hicks, our co-chairs of the strategic planning team. And um, we just want to invite all of you who are here in person to join us downstairs. If you're not here in person, please join us by Zoom online this coming Wednesday um, or the following Monday. And the connecting information is on the back of the bulletin. Or if, we, if you wish to call the church office to get the Zoom link, we would be happy to give that to you over the phone. And then finally, I want to just remind you that the months of April and May are um, Food Bank Challenge Month. Uh, any gift that you make to the South Michigan Food Bank, they will match that by 10% for our um, twice a month fresh food initiative, which is part of our ministry here. And so in order to help make our funds go further, we invite you to donate to the South Michigan Food Bank. I believe that that's all of the announcements before us today. Uh, let us turn our hearts and minds from the business of getting here and getting settled to the business and the joy of being in worship with our holy God. As we hear from Audie Heidenberg, uh, our prelude this morning.
Audie Heidenberg at the keyboard. What a blessing to us. Good morning, friends. My name is Earl Pulesky. I am your worship assistant for this morning. And if you're able, please rise for the call to worship. Easter people, we come to worship in confident expectation. Let us be open to the one who greets us wherever we gather. Our living Lord welcomes us. Our hearts are filled with joyous anticipation. We are glad for one another in God's awesome presence. God tests our faith and examines our community. God's spirit gives us counsel and instructs us. In Christ, we know true peace. In the Spirit's blessing, we are empowered to bring hope to a hurting world. Let us praise our God, revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Glory and honor to the one whose spirit we receive. And now our hymn of praise, uh, for those of you in possession of a hymnal, it's at page 303, Thine be the glory. Well sung congregation, you may take your seats. And now let's join together in our opening prayer. O risen Christ, whose presence was real to your first disciples, come among us in spite of the barriers we erect. Breathe on us that we too might receive the Holy Spirit. Lead us to stronger faith, evoke in us a forgiving spirit, and open our eyes to see the signs and wonders of God in our midst, that our service may be refreshed and renewed. Amen. So it's my privilege this morning to read the first lesson, Psalm 150, the very last psalm in the book. 
right before we get to Proverbs. Psalm 150, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, journeymen, for that rousing anthem. Oh, and lots of camp memories for me with that song. I want to in introduce to you uh, the co-chairs of our strategic planning task force, uh, Candy Pileski and Jan Hicks. They have uh, some things they want you to know about what's happening soon. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you today. Um, I am Candy Pileski. Thank you. I'm Candy Pileski, and I am one of the co-chairs of the strategic, strategic Planning Task Force. And we have a meeting after church today. It will be the first of many town halls. Uh, the town halls are one of the many ways that we are communicating with the church about what, what's happening with the strategic planning effort. Uh, we will be sharing information from the survey. We will also be listening and learning from, what from your feedback. 
we anticipate, I don't know why this happens to me when I come up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> we anticipate the meeting lasting about an hour. And um, if, as uh, Pastor Tyne said, if you're not available to stay today, it will be available on Zoom on Wednesday, this Wednesday, and then again on um, next Monday. So I get the job of asking you to come and start fulfilling our vision today by being open-minded and being inclusive in your thinking and your thoughts as we share with you what the congregation has provided us to take as a direction to meet our end goal, which is ultimately to fulfill the vision. So we welcome you and hope to see you all after service today. Yeah, that's great. Oop. Yeah, I'm live. Good. Sometimes we're invited to give toward things we don't know much about. Today's special offering for Native American Ministries might be that for you. It's one of the four special offerings we take throughout the year. Um, to support specific denomination efforts. Human Relations Day in January, Peace and Justice Sunday in May, and the United Methodist Student Day in November are the others. Perhaps you don't know about the work United Methodists do in Native American reservations and communities, but as we consider all the needs of all the people of God, you might imagine that these people in particular have many needs, collectively and individually, and perhaps we can trust that someone knows what those needs are, and they would appreciate your support. Your regular offering continues to provide the support for this church, our ministries, our personnel, our facilities, and unforeseen opportunities that come up here. So thank you for giving whatever you can. There are several ways to give today. You can leave a check in the offering plates or send one to the office. You can use PayPal through our website or you can set up regular giving by calling Teresa this week. Let's pray for these gifts. God of every good gift, receive what we offer today and mingle it with the gifts of members current and past so that the work of First Church in Jackson can continue and thrive. Bless what we offer and put it to work. In Christ we pray, amen. As we move into our prayer time this morning, we invite Audi to center us with some music while we pray in silence. Lord Jesus, open our eyes to see the ways you move and live and love through our lives. Open our hearts to receive the ones you send to us. Open our lips to share the glory of your name, not just here in this building, but wherever we find ourselves. Call us out of complacency and into deeper faith, even as we demand proof for what we've been told. Today we pray for all who have joy in their hearts. We pray for all who suffer from illness and pain. We pray for all who grieve the loss of loved ones.
We pray for all who give what they can for the benefit of others and for those who give all they can to care for themselves. Comfort us, enliven us, strengthen us. Lead us into new visions of your glory. We pray in Christ who walked among us even after his death and taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What a great message, journeymen. They need to hear it from you. They need to hear it from me, that joyous message. In that spirit, I want to share with you the joyous message from John's Gospel. This is yet another resurrection story. 
and um, we're going to stand as you're able to greet the risen Christ who is most present with us through his holy word. I'm reading from John chapter 20 beginning with verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the ho house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. <clears throat> Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Until I see the marks of the nails on his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and, hand, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may come to believe that jesus is the messiah the son of god and that through him believing you may have life in his name my brothers and sisters this is the good news from our good and gracious god let us all say Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> and let us pray together. Breathe on us, O God, your spirit, that we might be enlivened in our faith, excited about our witness, and empowered to leave this space and to share the good news with others. We ask it in Jesus' name and for the sake of his continuing work in the world. Amen. <clears throat> I read about a television interview with a fellow who was over 90 years old. We've got a few of those in our congregation. He played center field for a senior adult softball team down in Florida. The interviewer asked the man, how have you lived so long and stayed in such good shape? The man smiled at the camera and said, my mother makes me get out of bed every morning and get out of the house. Well, you don't have to be over 90 to know that's good advice. Long before this whole COVID pandemic and the strange requirements that have been placed on all of us and the ways that we are kind of now living into this new normal, long before this pandemic, I know there were times in my life when I just didn't want to leave the house. How about you? I just wanted to turn off the telephone, lock the doors, pull up the covers, and hide. Do you ever feel that way? Even still. 
Sometimes it seems the world is just too much to handle. So we need our homes to be safe places, a haven away from the storms that rage outside. On the other hand, if we want to accomplish anything, whether it's winning a softball game or going about the business of living, some t uh, sometimes we've just got to get out of the house in order to do it. And you know that's good advice for our church as well. John's Gospel gives us quite a picture of the first church at Easter time. The women returned from the graveyard with this astounding news, the Lord is risen. <clears throat> and instead of shouting, he is risen indeed. Thank you, I'm glad you remembered that. But instead of shouting that news from the rooftops, the disciples huddled together in the upper room of a house where Jesus had shared his final meal with them. Their doors were locked, their shutters were closed, and they cowered there in fear. Well, these were no fools. They had seen what happened to Jesus. Nails in his hands, a spear in his side, and then his lifeless body thrown into a cave. So, of course, they were fearful. Who wouldn't be? And then suddenly, in a breath, in the blink of an eye, Jesus was with them and said, Shalom, peace be with you. Have you ever noticed the first word of Easter is not rejoice. Jesus' first word of Easter is always something like, fear not, peace, shalom be with you. And I think we can understand why. How would you react if a dead person materialized before your eyes and spoke your name? I think I'd want to be wished some peace and some fear not too, wouldn't you? But then, as I think about it, the disciples shouldn't have been that surprised. After all, they had been with Jesus for three years. They had seen countless miracles. He changed water into wine, and he multiplied one boy's lunch of loaves and fishes into enough food to feed a whole multitude of people. They had seen him heal lepers and blind men. They had seen him walk on water. Why, they had even seen Jesus raise the dead back to life. And still they were shocked to see Jesus standing right before them. It seems no matter how many times the disciples witnessed miracles, they never saw this miracle coming. <laughs> so they were scared out of their wits. And that's, my friends, why they needed one another. Have you ever noticed that Jesus is more likely to appear when people are together than when they're not? If you look through all of the New Testament um, uh, encounters with the risen Christ, every single one of them, except for Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, all the others, the resurrection appearances happen with a group of his followers, the women in the tomb, the two friends on their walk to Emmaus, as we heard the story last week, and now the disciples in the upper room. In fact, John's Gospel tells us Thomas missed Jesus' first resurrection appearance in that upper room because he wasn't with the group. His friends were all talking about something Thomas didn't experience, so he must have felt left out. I imagine he questioned their experience, maybe doubted their sincerity, certainly doubted their sanity, don't you think? Another whole week went by. 
And when now they were all together in one place, Jesus appeared again, and this time Thomas believed. I've been uh, in pastoral ministry for well nigh on 30 years now, and I've seen that one of the worst mistakes a Christian can make is to avoid the fact that we need one another. And I think we can all say an amen to that, especially after having been separated for so many months. I've seen it happen time and time again. Someone faces a crisis, a family goes through some trauma, and what do they do? They withdraw into themselves. Maybe they're embarrassed. Maybe they're angry, or maybe they just don't know how to reach out and ask for help. But instead of staying connected with their church family and drawing from the support and encouragement they might find in Christian community, they suffer alone. So this morning I want to remind us the risen Christ is more likely to appear to us when we're together than when we're alone. That's why we gather in worship both online and in person every single week. And I am proud of the fact that even during this pandemic, we never missed a week of worship. Amen? We believe God's promise that wherever two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he will be with us. And so we come. We come together each and every week, wounded by the struggles and the failures of the week, weighed down by our personal cares and concerns with our family, paralyzed sometimes with fear and self-doubt and sometimes even feeling distance from God. And what happens when we come together in worship? Somehow, the risen Christ comes into our midst, offering us his peace. Somehow, our sorrow is eased just a little bit. Our burdens are lightened just a little bit. Our loneliness is certainly reduced Our depression is lifted just a bit, and our anxiety and fears are reduced when we experience the risen Christ together. But I also want to remind us this morning that Christ doesn't bless us just for our own good. I pointed to that just a little bit last week. I want to fill that out a little bit more this week. Notice in this story from John, he breathes his spirit on the disciples and then he sends those disciples out into the world to be his presence out there. Too many Christians forget that. We act as if taking care of each other is the only reason the church exists. Not so. Any of you are gardeners out there? Okay, imagine you have a garden and you want to grow juicy tomatoes and crisp cucumbers and sweet zucchini, some hot peppers with a row of bright sunflowers just for decoration. Doesn't that sound lovely? So you gather some workers, you meet at your garden shed, you show them the tools, tiller, hoe, rake and shovel, you teach them how to use the tools. They study the seeds to understand how to plant each properly. They learn how weeds can threaten the garden. Throughout the growing season, your workers gather in the shed every single week, and you enjoy your meeting so much, you put in a kitchen and start sharing meals together there. You even put a big sign by the shed that reads, Gardener's Guild, New Members Welcome. But you go outside and still there are no juicy tomatoes 
no crisp cucumbers, no sweet zucchini, not a single hot pepper, not one single bright sunflower to decorate your day. Why? Because, my friends, you can't grow a garden if you're sitting around inside the shed. Jesus came to his disciples hiding there in the upper room and said, As the Father sent me, I am sending you. In other words, he's telling them, Get out of the house. You aren't going to accomplish anything by hiding behind these locked doors or sitting in your home worshiping or in the church sanctuary. I think here, my friends, John's gospel is describing the double movement of the church. We come together to meet Christ and be renewed, and then we move out into the world to share good news and to finish the work that Christ started in us. It's like inhaling and exhaling. Inhaling and exhaling. If you don't do both, then you aren't breathing. And pretty quickly, we're going to die. Yes, we need each other. And yes, the world needs us. So there must be a balance between the inward movement of prayer, meditation, study, and worship, and the outward movement of service and mission and witness is if all the church does is pray and worship and care for one another, we will accomplish nothing. We will be good for nothing. On the other hand, if we go out there to the world without being grounded properly in prayer and worship and mutual love for one another, we will not have the sufficient stamina or courage to do the Lord's work for the long haul. Only the spirit of the risen Christ can give us the power to do the work of Christ. The spirit of Christ empowers us to do the work of Christ. We see this if you fast forward to the book of Acts. We see now the story picks up the disciples they're out of the house and in the streets a couple months after easter they're in the streets preaching the good news and they're opening blind eyes and giving strength to the lame and feeding the hungry and healing in jesus name and we ask where did they get that kind of courage where did they receive god's power to change the world well, you know, don't you? The disciples met Christ in the upper room, and he filled them with his life-changing, courage-building spirit and said, Go, get out of the house. I'm sending you into the world to continue the very work that I began here. Dear people, let us never forget this promise. Just as Christ was with those disciples so long ago, Christ is with us here and now. We are gathered in his name, and he has blessed us with his presence. He has spoken his word to us. Our, his word of peace to our sorrows and fears, our anxiety and disheartment, and he continues to renew us with the power of his Holy Spirit no matter what is happening in our world. In a few moments, the risen Christ is going to send us all once again into the world to continue his work in our neighborhoods and classrooms, in our workplaces, in the halls of government and corporate boardrooms, in all the places where people are hurting and waiting for help, 
waiting for a crust of bread or a cool drink of water, waiting for justice and mercy and peace and a word of good news for a change. We know there are people out there who continue to remain locked in, alone and afraid. There are folks who need to know the peace of Christ. And my friends, we must be about the business of sharing it. The risen Christ is counting on us to carry on his work. So let's do it. Let's get out of the house. Let us pray together. Dear Jesus, we thank you for meeting us here today in this sanctuary, in our homes, wherever we are worshiping. We thank you for the connection we have with you and with one another. Help us continue to grow in our faith and commitment to you, but help us also to follow you out of our time of worship into the world where you need us to be witnesses and to serve in your name. O oh Lord, you turned the world upside down with a handful of timid disciples. For the sake of this hurting world, we invite you to do it again, Lord. Do it again. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing hymn number 304. We are Easter pieces, uh, people. We're going to raise our voices and we are then going to share the good news with someone who needs to hear it in this coming week. Let us sing together. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, breathe in deeply. And now breathe out. That is the dual work of the church, my friends. We breathe in the Holy Spirit. We bring in the courage and the encouragement of our time together. But then we are sent out of the safety of the sanctuary, out of our homes, into the workplaces, into our neighborhoods, into the very places that Christ himself will lead us. Breathe in and don't forget to exhale. Find a way this week to share with someone a cup of cold water, a crust of bread, a meal, a word of hope, a word of encouragement, a reminder that God is with them.
even when they're struggling. Brothers and sisters, get out of the house. Amen. <laughs>